Listening to podcasts is no replacement for real training. While we attempt to provide accurate commentary, we hold no responsibility on how you use the information we provide. Get medical training. In the blink of an eye, everyday order can be replaced with once-in-a-lifetime chaos. Be prepared. This is the Civilian Medical Podcast. Hello and welcome everyone. Another episode of the Civilian Medical Podcast is here. My name is Sean Heron. I'm here with my buddy Dietrich, the skinny medic. Uh, Dietrich, how are you? Good. How are you, sir? I'm doing great, man. I feel like we were just here. I, I feel like we've, we've been seeing a lot of each other the last few days. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Hey, I, I know that our guest today is uh, to me a very interesting one. You seem to know him already. So why don't you go ahead and introduce him and tell us who we're going to be talking to today. Yes. Yeah, so I decided to bring my friend Bobby onto the show. Uh, Bobby and I have been friends since probably what, 2002-ish, somewhere around there. Uh, we worked at the same system together, small EMS service. And um, when we first became friends, uh, my wife had a great paying job and his wife had a great paying job. We had no kids. So we would work our 24 hour shift together. Uh, and then the two days off, we would hike, go eat, go like hang out. And, and while our wives are working and we would just get to have fun. And then all of a sudden things changed and like, what now we're actually having to work for a living. And, um, so yeah, Bobby and I've been, I've been friends for a long time. I've got some cool stories kind of hope share. Um, I mean, hopefully he doesn't say that I'm, you know, embarrassed me too much by just saying how much better of a paramedic than I am than him. Uh, but you know, maybe some shows about how we got lost in the woods together, um, the Jeep top going into a hotel room. Uh, so we've got some cool stories to say. So I thought it'd be cool to bring him in. He works for American Heart Association. So you can tell us CPR and kind of give some embarrassing thoughts to me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Hey, start off with just telling us how you got into medicine. I got into it, uh, kind of backed into it in a way. I was uh, in college and I got a job to pay my way through college as a security guard at the university. And they said, hey, there's this EMT class and we'll pay you to take it. So for me, it was pretty simple. Uh, I'm paying to take classes and you're going to pay me to take another one. So I'm, I'll be happy to do that. Uh, then by the time I finished my bachelor's degree, I had already started working part time as an EMT and realized pretty quickly that that was something I really enjoyed and wanted to move forward with that. So I went back to school uh, through paramedic school back in the early 2000s, and the rest is uh, is history. Very cool. Where, where did the uh, AHA come in come into play? Well, as you know, uh, very few paramedics can afford to live on just their paramedic income. So <laughs> I started picking up some some side jobs on the side, and I, I worked as a paramedic full time with one county and then part time in the next county over. But the challenge with that is that's just a lot of clinical work and a lot of carrying people. So I started teaching CPR and then I started teaching ACLS and uh, PALS, the more advanced courses, uh, teaching them often with Dietrich, as a matter of fact. And um, after a while, I um, was sitting bored at the station one day, which is commonly what gets paramedics fired, but it worked out well for me. I was bored surfing the internet on uh, the Journal of EMS website and found this job posting. So. Back in 2010, uh, I applied for it in January and ended up moving to Texas and uh, starting the job in May of 2010. And I've been there ever since. So you were looking for a job that you could travel and eat all on yes. someone else's dime. And yes. you got it. I had a friend there in Greenville who worked for, uh, for Michelin and he was an auditor and he would travel around to all of their locations around the world. And so he was in Thailand and Mexico and all this stuff. And I thought, man, that is amazing. There's no way I can go from working as a paramedic on a truck and doing training to that type of job. And then, boom, I found one. So here I am. <laughs> Pretty dang awesome. We yes. competed uh, in the South Carolina Paramedic Competition right before that. Yes, April of 2010. Yeah, we, uh, we we won regional. And then okay. what did we, we, did we place in the state or did we? They didn't tell us. Um, okay. We did not win right. that that year for state. I went back right. and won later right. on after you left, but uh, we did not win that year. So you got the process refined for yes, you. Yes, I did. Uh, during I would, I'll tell myself tell myself during that one. Uh, we were doing this paramedic competition. It's in a gymnasium, and you have at least probably a hundred people there. 
um, that are watching and they're judging you as they're sitting on the bleachers drinking their Cokes and popcorn. And there are like, real judges there that are judging you. And it's MCI. And this, it was like a car wreck with a parachuter had went down through the windshield or through sunroof. the sunroof. Yes. Yeah. And parachute so, didn't open and they went through the sunroof. Yes. So it's just Bobby and I, and we have limited equipment and, um, we get split apart. Obviously that's what they're trying to do. And we're working And this, this lady, we pull her out of the car and she's like, I'm having trouble breathing, having trouble breathing. And I'm like, okay, okay. And she goes, I have this. And she hands me her inhaler. And I was like, Oh, okay. I look at it and I stick it in my pocket and I get out the oxygen tank and I start giving her an albuterol treatment. I build this nebulizer out. I'm like, I am rocking this. This is awesome. And I'm like, Bobby, what do you have going on over there? And he goes, Oh, I have this head injury. I'm bagging. And I realize Bobby's bagging a head injury without oxygen because I'm using the oxygen. I'm like, oh, that sucks. And we run the scenario. Everything's done. And we walk out the door. And I stick my hand in my pocket. And one of the other judges comes back and go, um, can you give me that inhaler? And I was like, oh, no. <laughs> I should have given her the inhaler to use and let Bobby use the oxygen for the head injury patient. So I knew we'd not done well that year. And it was not my fault, but I mean, it was there. I think that was the only thing that we could really point at that we didn't do really well. Um, yeah. They like to throw a lot of curveballs at you. So there are previous years where there are major safety hazards. And so paramedics would, you know, I'm giving air quotes here, paramedics would die during the competition because they touched live wires or things like that. And we, uh, we were very careful with everything we did and we moved through our assessments pretty quickly. So I was, I was pretty happy with it. I but, mean, to be honest, we were surprised we even won the regional competition given some of the people we were competing against. Yes. But that's just awesome. to clear the record, I went back and won three years in a row. So that's true. Oh man. <laughs> just for the record, just times. so we're all on the same page here. So <laughs> Bobby does have a great job, but um, I, I, I do get to post stuff on social media for a living. So mm -hmm. there, there you go. <laughs> um, I guess maybe let's, let's talk about CPR and um, some of those things. Where do you want to start Dietrich? Yeah, so just kind of start from the basics, like who is like American Heart Association and like what do what do they do? Like why is it important to, to support them? Yeah, so the AHA does a lot of things. Uh, it's a nonprofit based here in Dallas. We were founded back in the 1920s, well before my time. And um, now we do a lot of work around um, trying to encourage people to live more healthily, to... Um, encourage better research to fund research and uh, to really focus on all different aspects of good diet, um, active lifestyle, and then a lot on the medical side around research and promoting cardiovascular health. Specifically to what I do is, is our emergency cardiovascular care programs, which is what you'd commonly think of when you think of uh, CPR courses and the more advanced courses that we do for healthcare providers. Um, so we've been doing that since it was since it really became um, a thing, which was about 60 years ago when CPR was invented or discovered as a treatment. And uh, it's it's evolved quite a bit since then, but the basics are still there. You know, you're pushing on the chest and you're circulating the blood for the patient, and then you're breathing for them in some way, either with a device or mouth to mouth. And um, you know, we've done a lot of research to see how we can move the move the needle on survival and increase survival for patients around the world um, and that's that's really where i come in because i work a little bit with our science side and and looking at what they do on the research side and developing guidelines for treatment but more of what i do is taking the training materials and finding ways to implement them in uh, countries around the world so I, I deal exclusively with our international training network outside of the u.s we do training now in about 90 countries. And uh, outside of the U.S., we trained about 3.1 million people last year. Wow. That's awesome. That is yes. that's pretty crazy. So uh, clearly CPR works, right? Like, do you guys have statistics on uh, on things like that? Absolutely. And, you know, I think the audience that you guys speak to who are largely not professional healthcare providers, but are very interested in equipping themselves with the right training and equipment to uh, to make a difference before EMS gets there. Those are the people that are really making a difference with CPR. When you look at regional CPR survival rates, when people go into cardiac arrest, their heart stops, they collapse. 
Um, there's really good data throughout the U.S. that shows that the bystanders who are there when the cardiac arrest happens are the people who make the biggest difference, much more than we do as paramedics. Uh, Seattle, for example, King County, Washington, they're well known because they've invested very heavily in their system of care. So if you have a cardiac arrest in a public place in Seattle, you have probably a 40% chance to 45% chance of living. And that's a really big deal. That's huge. Um, whereas other places in the U.S., you know, I don't want to call out too many places, but there are there are some cities that are notorious for having really bad uh, rates of bystander CPR. And, uh, you know, your your survival chances there are around half percent to one percent. Oh uh, and then, you know, when we start looking at some international places where there's very little awareness of CPR, there's no AED training, we, we see even more dismal uh, statistics, if it's possible. Um, so it, it really makes a big difference. And it is very much up to the bystanders, the people who are there when it happens. Uh, a lot of times when we train people in CPR, they kind of get this mental picture in mind of uh, they see someone collapse while they're walking in a mall. And that may be that may be partially to the blame of the, the way that the videos are developed in our courses and things like that. But re in reality, in the U.S., 80% of cardiac arrests happen in the home. So if you're learning CPR, the chance that the chance is good that you're going to be doing CPR in your own family member if you ever have to use that skill. Um, so that's that's a, uh, a skill that you really want to have in your set. Um, you don't want to be standing there over a family member thinking, man, I really wish I'd gotten this training earlier. What song do you prefer to perform CPR to? <laughs> um, I would very quietly sing Another One Bites the Dust to myself in my head. <laughs> See, like not I one do. That, not one that you want to sing out loud. Yeah. But for some reason, uh, the, the, the beat with that is just a lot easier for me to get into the right cadence than, you know, Staying Alive or something See, like I, that. I do Staying Alive for kids. I'm like, all right, Staying Alive for kids, Another One Bites the Dust for adults. Um, sure, sure. But I know guys who have podcasts, like not podcasts, they have like playlists on their phones, like all sure. these songs that are, you know, that 100, 110 beats a minute that they right. don't necessarily play. But I'm like, I guess you can put your headphones on and go to town. Right. Absolutely. But, you know, like Just you were saying, like, caught singing another one bites the dust out loud while you're doing oh, CPR that's awkward. on someone. People <laughs> ask questions when that happens. <laughs> oh, man. I can only imagine. So, but I mean, you're right, though, by the, the by center CPR, like every save that I have in my career, someone was doing CPR before I ever got there. You know, right. a bystander, a loved one, a family member, whoever was doing chest compressions before I ever got there. No um, kidding. I can't think of a single time that nobody was doing CPR or even until the fire department got there or whatever. That, and that was in, end up being a save. Yeah. It's heavily, heavily skewed toward people who uh, have bystanders doing CPR on them. I would say the, the biggest exceptions that I had in my clinical career were people who went into cardiac arrest after I got there. So they were complaining of chest pain or shortness of breath or something. We got on scene and uh, before we could give definitive care, they went into cardiac arrest and, and we started CPR. And so several of those we got back, but you know, what, if it's, you know, an eight to 10 minute response time, the, uh, the statistics say that their chance of survival is going to decline about 10% every minute that they go without chest compressions. So if, the average average EMS response time in your community is somewhere around eight to ten minutes. Then you know you're you're pretty much ruling them out at, if no one's willing to do CPR beforehand. Wow, pretty impressive. So clearly, lots of research going into it. Uh, you said you work a little bit with the science side, but how often do you guys release updates? Historically, we've done it every five years. So in 2005, 10, 15. In 2015, we made a decision to do a more continuous evidence evaluation where we, we have groups that meet at the AHA every uh, twice a year, so every six months. And then there's a, a larger group called ILCOR. We really like our acronym, so I'll, I'll take a second to explain some of them. <laughs> ILCOR is the International Liaison Committee on Resuscitation. And there's also a little bit of a double entendre there because ILCOR with ill being sick and core referring to heart um, kind of has a, a second meaning. And um, ILCOR is made up of resuscitation uh, groups from around the world with the American Heart Association being one, the European Resuscitation Council, the Resuscitation Councils of Australia, New Zealand, et cetera. And uh, they meet every year. Uh, we just met uh, last month in um, Cape Town, South Africa. 
And uh, what they do is they evaluate, they'll take a question and they'll say, for example, what is what should we do for a CPR ratio of compressions to ventilations? And they'll identify a task force that will look at that question and they'll analyze every single study they can find. And it's usually pretty crazy. The, the numbers are usually somewhere around starting with 9,000 studies. And then they want to look at ones that are equivalent so that they can compare them and they'll you know filter it down and get down to 50 or 100 or 200 studies that they can evaluate that really look at that question. Um, and then they develop a consensus. Uh, so ILCOR doesn't write guidelines, but they write what is a consensus where it's this group of experts sitting in a room basically says, based on the evidence we see, this is what we recommend. Then each resuscitation council like the AHA will write guidelines based on that consensus statement. And the guidelines are a little more specific. So the consensus statement may say something like, it's taking providers too long to go from entering the room and seeing the patient to doing their first compression, and that's reducing survival. Uh, so in 2010, that was one of the areas of discussion. So the guideline that came of that was AHA switching from ABC to CAB, because what we found was that people were uh, providers as they were approaching patients and they were looking at assessing their airway and breathing first, it was extending the amount of time before they started CPR to 30 seconds, 60 seconds, a minute, two minutes. There were some, um, EMS systems that were actually tracking this. And there were two, two and a half minute gaps after the paramedics walked into the room before they started CPR. Hmm. So the idea was, well, if we start by just checking the pulse, that's gonna skip out the whole airway assessment component. So there's no question of, did I feel a breath? Maybe I didn't have the airway tilted right. And you're not just messing around with that. You go straight to checking a pulse, no pulse, we're gonna do compressions. So the guideline was changed. Uh, from ABC to CAB as the assessment sequence to get us doing chest compressions faster to improve survival. So that's kind of the way the flow works. And then we, the last component after that is um, translating all of that into training materials and deploying those so that people can get the right training. Yeah, definitely. That, that's kind of, that's a big change, but I bet it has a very, very positive effect. Yes. I think we've seen uh, pretty good results from that. Um, that, small change i like the fact that we're getting updates more often because right now the way it seems the world is going things happen quickly um you know science evidence-based medicine we're seeing a lot of research come out quickly so not having to wait five years to say oh this is a better practice this is could get us this could save lives let's roll it out faster so i like getting the updates faster like that absolutely um some people say that five years is too much because you have to change what you're doing every five years and you had to change the materials that you trained with and things like that. But at the same time, if we have information that would help people to provide better care to patients, we want to get that as soon as possible out to the mass, uh, the mass uh, media and, and uh, the people that we're training. Yeah. That makes me wonder, like uh, doing them more often and things like that, logistically, that's huge, right? Cause you have to update your training documents and things like that. Then you need to make all the collateral, um, the, pamphlets and everything else in the universe and you have to get that out to people and a lot of the people who teach cpr they're like um contractors almost kind of right. they, like, they get certified and then they start their own thing and they put their classes up on american red cross and people go to those classes and like when you think about logistically changing from abc to cab that's like a huge thing uh can you speak to that at all it is uh how much time do you have that's a really long uh involved process because there's there's just a number of steps we go through uh with multiple different reviews of new science to make sure that we are uh, accurately reflecting what the evidence says uh, we do now post the ilcor posts uh, all these consensus ideas for public review so that we can get feedback from other paramedics to find stuff that we may not have anticipated and then on the production side, we we have uh, a lot of discussions around how do we incorporate what we now know into the material we have now without reshooting videos and republishing materials and things like that. And uh, then everything has to go through, you know, copy edit and people have to make sure that it's everything looks right. And then we have to communicate all of that to our instructors. And we have about 400,000 instructors between the U.S. and our international training network. So communicating that effectively out to 400,000 people and making sure that they know what they're supposed to be teaching so they can 
train the uh, the providers around the world. That's it's complicated. And then with my side on the international, we have all the translation components. So we translate our uh, BLS course into 13 different languages. Okay. And then some of our other courses are translated into fewer languages or different languages. So it's there's a lot of downstream effects from making one change in the science. I can, I can only imagine that's it's pretty crazy to think about it. And especially, I mean, when you're doing it every five years, it makes sense because it takes a lot to do that. But yeah, doing it more often, that's that's going to be pretty huge. But seriously, it's it's going to save lives. So absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. One of the things that American Heart talks about, like, and they kind of like tag it on the end of their videos, is about chest pains and strokes, stuff like that. So, I thought maybe we just kind of cover that just for a minute, uh, just talking about, you know, what someone could do if they're at home, uh, especially this holiday season, thinking about, you know, someone's grandma starts having chest pain, things like that. Definitely. You know, I think um, we have seen some research that shows that around the holidays, particularly, Christmas, um, there is an increase in heart attacks. There's a lot of different ideas behind what causes that. It could be the food that we're eating. It could be the stress of dealing with family and, uh, you know, getting together and talking politics with Uncle John and you know, <laughs> whatever it could be. There's a lot of different reasons why you might uh, be undergoing increased stress over the holidays, um, the amount that you spent on Christmas presents or whatever. So we do see a lot more of uh, cardiac related emergencies around the holidays. So, you know, the, the important things are if someone starts experiencing chest pain, well, I guess we'll start with heart attacks. So if someone's experiencing chest pain, then that's something that needs to be addressed immediately. There are dozens of things that can cause someone to experience chest pain, but if it's a sudden onset, you know, there's quite a few of those dozen things are, are life-threatening, particularly heart attacks. Uh, so that's something you would want to immediately call an ambulance, get them to the hospital, get evaluated. It's uh, it's not worth waiting it out. Uh, the the key with myocardial tissue, which is the, the tissue in the heart, that's the actual muscle that contracts your heart, is if, if it goes without oxygen uh, for too long, you will not recover that muscle tissue in the long run. So the sooner you can get assessed, the sooner you can be evaluated at a hospital, uh, the better the outcome is if you're having a heart attack. And with all of the other different things that chest pain can cause, can be coming from, uh, those are also pretty time sensitive as well. Um, stroke is very similar because brain tissue also has a, a very short timer before a lack of oxygen starts to really cause long-term problems. Um, so we use the the FAST acronym uh, a lot to help people to remember what the signs and symptoms are of stroke. If you're looking at someone who's suddenly had some changes, uh, that that would be something you'd want to call an ambulance for. And so there, the acronym is FAST, so facial drooping, arm weakness, speech difficulties, and then um, time is the last thing because time is of the essence. So it's important to immediately call for an ambulance and uh, and get them to the hospital. It seems like the time is getting pushed out further and further now. Um, it depends where you some, are. Some hospitals, yeah. Right. If you're in a really rural area where it's going to be, you may not have access to a certified stroke center, uh, then it's probably still going to be about three hours from when your symptoms start to when you need to have definitive treatment. So you have to factor in recognizing the symptoms, getting the ambulance there, getting them to the hospital. Um, then you're dependent on a whole bunch of other things as, you know, what are the hospital's resources? Are they overwhelmed? Are they super busy? How fast can they get you into evaluation and uh, get you started on treatment? So the part that we as, as family members can have an impact on when we're at home over the holidays is that recognition of symptoms and activating EMS and getting EMS out there. So that's that's the important thing for, I think, most people to understand is that the part you can have an influence on is getting them into the system as quickly as possible uh, so that there's time for the paramedics and the doctors to do their work. Definitely. We talked about that in a previous show. We we're like, you know, most of the time they want to know exactly what time this symptom started, whether you're watching Days of Our Lives at 1.30 or you're eating breakfast, watching you know the news at 7:30 in the morning. I like to have a pretty good time frame of when this the when this all started. The problem comes in is when someone wakes up and they were fine when they went to bed, and they wake up the next morning at six o'clock, 
and they're experiencing the stroke signs that we see uh, as symptoms. So that can be a problem. But like you said, you know, if we can call EMS, get them uh, recognize that something's wrong with grandma and we need to get some help there uh, to figure it out. And then yes. kind of back up to that chest pain thing. You know, when you call 911, hopefully the dispatcher there is going to be able to give you some pre pre arrival stuff you know, before the EMS gets there, first responder. So they may ask you about giving aspirin, things like that. So they're going to ask right. you questions about if they're allergic to it, uh, any kind of GI issues, and maybe uh, look at giving them some uh, aspirin. And then if they're prescribed nitro, maybe you can look at that kind of thing, that situation too. But uh, the dispatcher will be able to help you out with that yeah. area. And while while we're on that, I'd jump back to CPR really quickly. One of the one of the big things that is being done now to improve CPR rates is that dispatchers are giving those instructions for people, teaching them how to do CPR. So if someone gets in a position where they have not been trained and they're sitting there next to their family member, thinking, "Man, I really wish I'd gotten that training," call nine one one and they can talk you through how to give CPR. Um, I definitely would say you'd feel better and more prepared if you got the training ahead of time. Uh, but worst case scenario, we do have, uh, there's a lot of resources for dispatchers now to receive that training. So how, of how they can talk someone through doing CPR. Um, but back to heart, heart attacks, then yes, um, that is what aspirin is one of the things that a lot of times they will do in advance uh, to make sure that they can get that medicine going and into the bloodstream as soon as possible. Yeah. And we'll keep circling back. Like, but like the, the CPR thing, um, we've kind of done away with mouth to mouth for the most part, except for like choking and for drowning victims. Thank goodness. Cause mouth to mouth is gross. Right. You guys never showed that in video, like the beer and pizza coming back up. Like <laughs> you guys never show that you're like, Oh, if you don't have a barrier device, you can't perform mouth to mouth. And it's this like clean cut chick or guy like, okay, no big deal. But in the real world, it's vomit, chunky beef stew. Yes. With People always out. eat beef stew before they, before they go into cardiac arrest. They do. <laughs> like, you see like chunks of potatoes and carrots and you're like, I'm not doing mouth to mouth to that. So doing chest compressions, you know, only for, especially lay people has been, has been a nice improvement. I think people are more comfortable saying, yes, I will push on your chest for eight minutes till first responders get here. Much less. Right. I'm not doing mouth to mouth to you. Right. I think I would go back to the, the 80% of cardiac arrests happen in the home statistic to start with and say, you know, if it's one of my family members, sure, I'll do mouth to mouth on them. But if I'm, uh, and I hate using the mall analogy because who actually goes to a mall anymore, but if I'm out at, you know. Shopping Amazon. Uh, if I'm out <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> somewhere in town, um, you know, and I'm at the store or church or whatever, and I see someone collapsed, then I'm definitely going to do hands-only CPR. Uh, the, the data shows that the survival rates from doing hands-only or compressions and breaths is very similar, particularly for the first six to eight minutes. Um, after that, there's more of a need for those breaths, but hopefully by then, you have some sort of barrier device or EMS is there or something along those lines. Um, so one of the, one of the things that I do carry is a, uh, a barrier device to make sure I always have one of those just in case I get into that circumstance. And then there are other situations like drowning, for example, um, or largely for kids, uh, it is better if you can give breaths. But um, for the most part, we've found that one of the largest barriers for people to do CPR uh, is that they're looking at that person thinking, I'm not putting my mouth on them. So we would come away with the with the thing and say, just if you remember anything, remember, do something. At least do chest compressions, push on the chest hard and fast, and you know just do that. And that is much better than doing nothing. Yeah, so you can get your barrier devices at medicalgearoutfitters.com. <laughs> exactly. Say 10% civilian medic, uh, civilian medical. So yep. yeah, we do have, we got the little like, shield ones that go in your pocket and we've got the hard plastic ones. So we even have the BVMs. Like if you don't want to get your hands anywhere near there. Uh, I've said that I won't do mouth to mouth unless like a Ivanka Trump falls down and then I'm like, Oh, I'll do mouth to mouth. So, <laughs> or like Carrie Underwood, like if you know, something like that, if they're listening, like, you know, if Carrie Underwood listens to our show, like I would definitely yeah, that won't do, creep her out at all to hear that. Yes. I, I will definitely be her personal medic if she needs one. So if, if, if she's listening to our show, just so you know, <laughs> Just in case. Just in case. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful. Yes. So let's see. Where where do you want to go next? Um. So we can kind of talk about. Um. I know Bobby's really big in in the wilderness medicine. Um. He's done a couple of competitions, things like that. Uh. I've done what two? Got lost in one. Yes. 
<laughs> so we did, uh, there's a competition called Medical Wilderness Adventure Race, and it's a, uh, a series of races throughout the U.S. It's a wilderness adventure race, so you're not just running along a path following signs that say, go this way. You're, you're navigating with the compass. They give you headings or they give you coordinates for your next stop. And then each checkpoint has, um, they'll have either a multiple choice question that you can answer that's related to wilderness medicine, something along the lines of how would you treat a bite from this snake? And it will show a picture of a coral snake or uh, they'll show uh, different mushrooms and say which one of these is edible. And as we've already established, Dietrich cannot tell the difference between edible and inedible mu <laughs> mushrooms. And, uh, and then an, and then some of the checkpoints, they'll have scenarios set up where they'll have actual people. It's kind of like uh, if you're in EMS, a national registry station where they have a patient uh, there, there's a scenario, and you have to go through this treatment protocol. And any, any points that you miss, they add time to your final score. So at the end of the day, you've run about 10 to 12 miles. You've probably canoed a mile or two. And then uh, they usually have a bike loop where you bike for probably a couple miles through the woods. Uh, I think I've done that eight or nine times now. Uh, it's a team effort. So I've always gone with a couple of my friends from South Carolina. Uh, Dietrich went the first year and then he took a few years off and then he came back and we did pretty well that year. I think we were like mid teens, 14 or 15th place out of 40 teams. Uh, at, since then we've done um, seventh, sixth. Uh, we got third one year. And I think the last few times we've gotten fourth. It's always the same teams now in the top four. So it's pretty pretty difficult but you came back and competed against me one time and y'all just got desperately lost in the woods yes like we like i bobby had his own team uh, I, I couldn't get on there so i was like all right i bring my own team up and we're looking at the coordinates and there was a road that was we were just like it is right here and we could not find that stupid road we wandered around the woods lost for a while because we could not find a stupid road so very disappointing. Like Bobby's tracking back and forth. Like, hey, what are you guys doing? Like, oh, we're good. We're good. You guys okay? And they then like good. two hours later, we'd be in the same spot. And he'd come back. You guys good? Yep. Yeah, we're good. We're good. And it, it didn't work out so well for us. So oh, um, man. we felt like we made great time that day. And then we came out of the woods and, and went back to turn in our timesheet. And Dietrich and his team were already loaded up in the truck, showered and everything. And we we're like, how did you guys finish so fast? And then we realized they just got lost and gave up. <laughs> let's just go to dinner guys this is yeah. it this, this is it that's what we're here for anyway that's right that's right it's just a good excuse to get together yes but it's definitely it's a learning experience i mean obviously you're learning compass uh headings reading stuff like that um you know how to actually read a map properly um and then you know there's some patient care stuff involved and it kind of does work on your physical fitness because like you were saying yes. you're you're bike riding you're canoeing so um it's it's cool. And they have them all across, um, like what, Tennessee, Georgia, Virginia. Yeah, they have a bunch now. I think they've even had some up in Canada, out West in Utah. We just always seem to find uh, the timing just seems to work really well for us to go to Newport news, Virginia every year in March and do it. So that's, I've been going back there. That's pretty cool. That is yeah. Really cool. Yeah. But it's a good skill set to learn and, and keep fresh. And, uh, you know, if Dietrich can work on his navigating skills, he might compete again. But I, I, I mean, I've been search, you've been on the search and rescue team now, but you know you have a guy from the Forest Service plowing a hole through the woods in a bulldozer. That doesn't really help you with your navigation skills. It but. does. Like they, that's what they they <laughs> they put me in charge of the team too. Like that's what's ridiculous. I'm like, you guys don't know what you're talking. You don't know what you're doing. Um, they but yeah, like we're like every time. Yes, like we need to get there. And some guy in a bulldozer just plows through it for us, and we just like, walk up like we're ready to go. Using your strengths. Yes. Yes. And then, so you said, obviously, you're traveling a good bit internationally. Um, yep. And so when someone says, is there a doctor on board the airplane, do you, like, keep reading your book or do you, like, raise your hand or what do you do? So it used to be about 50-50. I would kind of <laughs> sit there and look around. And uh, one time I was coming back from Ireland and there was a big EMS conference there. And they came over and about 30 people stood up because there had been a big EMS conference there. So they were, like, a ton of people in front of me. So I was like, all right, I'm just going to sit back down. Uh, but a few years ago, I was on a flight uh, between Dallas and London and we got out over the Atlantic ocean and they came on and there was a lot of turbulence. So they, they had the seatbelt light on. They came on and said, if there's any healthcare providers, uh, ring your call button and we'll come back and get you. We have an emergency. So I turned my light on. No one came by, no one came by. So I waited a few minutes and, uh, 
finally I, I got up and flagged down a stewardess and she said, all right, I'll go, I'll go check, go, go back to your seat and buckle up for now. So she went and checked and she came back and she's like, there's a nurse back there with him. We're good. And I said, okay, well, I'm a paramedic. Let me know if you need anything. If she needs any help, come get me. And the stewardess says, okay, fine, fine. We're, we'll, we'll let you know. So about 20 minutes later, she comes back and taps me on the shoulder. And she says, thank you so much for volunteering to help. Unfortunately, he died. Um, but thank you for volunteering. And I was like, what? I, I have no disrespect to nurses, but there's a very wide variety of nurses. Like maybe she worked in a podiatrist's office or maybe she was an ER nurse. But either way, I'm that part between sick and dead is kind of where I specialize. That right. would have been really <laughs> good if they had asked me to come back. Because I'm sure she would have loved to have seen another person come back and help her. Yeah, that's kind of uh, your wheelhouse. That's what I do. So, <laughs> yeah. So I was kind of disappointed. It was a little late by then. So we just kind of rode on. And when we got to London, we had to wait in the the police came on and did a, an investigation to make sure there was no foul play. And that was it. So since then I've uh, more aggressively volunteered because I don't want to be in that situation again. Uh, but I have seen, um, I've seen some interesting things. I had a reporter who had from uh, London who had gone to Africa. She'd contracted malaria, which had uh, developed further into kidney failure, recovered from all of that. And then she got assigned to Northern Canada and the, the nasty thing about malaria is it comes back. Uh, it can come back at any time. You're never uh, done with it for the rest of your life. You don't have to be bitten by an infected mosquito again. Once it's in your system, it can come and go as it pleases, basically. So she was in northern Canada where they're not really familiar with malaria treatment, and it happened again. And uh, she had went into kidney failure again, went back home, and then a little prematurely decided to go to Dallas with some friends for a weekend and, and started having some severe uh, GI bleeding on the plane as we were leaving Dallas. Um, very faint pulse, very low blood pressure, um, really, uh, really bad situation. So we ended up diverting uh, to Chicago, landing there, and Chicago EMS came on and, and got her. So there's been quite a few interesting things that I've seen, um, you know, beyond the kind of the normal thing that happens on an airplane is just chest pain and shortness of breath due to anxiety when there's turbulence. That that I've seen a little bit more frequently. Okay. What do you, you know, I know you carry a CPR shield. Do you carry any other kind of like medical equipment? I carry a CPR shield and gloves when I fly internationally. And that's really about it because um, there's just a lot of questions I don't want to be asked when I'm going through customs as to why I have like more advanced gear or anything <laughs> like that. Um, and I feel like the, the chance of needing a tourniquet on an airplane is probably less than in every other aspect of life. You don't travel so, with Sean. Well, no, but <laughs> you want to <laughs> sounds like fun. If I, if I need a tourniquet for it, <laughs> good chance, honestly. Uh, so when I'm traveling in the U S I'll carry a little bit more. I carry, I have a little first aid kit with uh, a tourniquet, a uh, cat five, and then, um, um, you know, some other bandaging gear and, uh, I'll keep that with me as well. But internationally, I, I travel a little bit lighter with, with some of that gear. Cause I don't want them thinking that I'm intending to do anything where I would be in a circumstance where I would need that. Yeah. That, that actually makes a lot of sense. Do you, uh, do you get your kits from, Civilian, med civilian uh, <laughs> gear outfitters. Jeez. Medical gear outfitters. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I just got a, a shipment over the weekend. I uh, ordered a couple little things for my son, who's uh, all of a sudden had this interest in in EMS. So I, he found one of my wilderness first aid books, and he's been just plowing through it. Awesome. So I broke out my you know two thousand page. Uh, wilderness medicine book, and we started going through that. There's a few pictures in there that are a little, uh, little too much for a five-year-old, so we skipped over those. But he's been super interested. So my most recent purchase was just some some light stuff for him, and uh, we um, so we got that over the weekend. I, you know, posted a picture of him with all of his all of his gear, and he's got a stethoscope and a skinny medic hat now, so he's cool. It's perfect. Yeah, he, he's ready he tells, to go. He tells everyone that he's a paramedic everywhere he goes now. Yes. So awesome. so. You should get him to listen to the podcast. <laughs> uh, he'll probably listen to this one yes perfect I, i'll make sure that i don't say anything <laughs> <laughs> probably don't listen to the combat midwife that might be a little much he may have some questions right he yeah. listens to that podcast but um, I, mean, I have questions after that podcast we did we we had lots of well, sean and i were like um 
you should probably have her back on. We have some few more questions about childbirth. <laughs> yeah, that, that was good stuff. Stuff I never thought about. Did you know, Bobby, you can stick garlic there? The treat of... Uh, what, do you mean, what do you mean there? Can you expound on that for me, please? Yes. Uh, we can expand afterwards. <laughs> if your son's listening to this, I don't want to... <laughs> or should I call my mom and ask? <laughs> yeah, call your mom and ask. <laughs> it's, it's for yeast infections. Yes. Uh, you can use a clove of garlic, apparently. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I didn't know. I'm going to go try it. I did not either. I just need a volunteer. <laughs> are you going to be the volunteer for that? Because I have more questions now. Suddenly more questions are popping up. No, no, no. <laughs> oh, man. So what about like Good Samaritan laws? That's always a concern, especially with guys who, learn, who listen to the podcast, things like that, is you know, they're scared to get involved. They're at the restaurant. Someone starts choking, and they're like, I had a CPR class two years ago, but it's a little shady, a little sketchy, um, and they're scared to get up. Well, I'd say if you're in the U.S., the Good Samaritan laws are uh, pretty consistent throughout the country. Uh, I don't like to give legal advice, but as a general rule, what they say is that uh, if you are providing care that is at your level of training and it's reasonable, then you're covered from from liability. Um, you know, so I would not be, you know, pulling out a knife and cutting someone's throat because they were choking if I were untrained to do that. Um, are you even trained for, to do that? I am, uh, <laughs> but. I did. There was a, a study came out uh, just this week talking about uh, the success rate for EMS in, in doing surgical crikes, and it was not good. It was like 17% uh, success rate first try. So even trained providers, it's a very difficult skill. So that would not be a reasonable thing for someone to do within their training unless they were specifically trained to do that. But as a general rule, if you're in the U.S., then I would say you're um, you're safe to do CPR to help con control bleeding. Things like that are, are usually considered very reasonable. Outside of the U.S., it's it varies from country to country. Uh, some countries, their Good Samaritan law is different. It says not that you're covered from liability. It says you have to help if you're trained and you come upon this. And I don't really know that they've ever had any prosecutions of someone who walked by and, you know, pretended not to see it. But uh, it's good to know. Ultimately, it's, it's important to know what your local laws are and what the laws are where you're going. Uh, there are definitely countries in the world where there's no Good Samaritan protection. That's something that we, uh, we have some advocacy people who work on things like that and help countries to see um, the need for that. We work we don't work directly with the local government. We work through volunteers who are there, usually someone who's uh, more influential in the medical community. We help them, give them the resources, and then they lobby their government. There's a lot of complications with lobbying other governments that we don't like to get involved in. So <laughs> um, we, we work with the local po folks and give them the resources that they need to, to make a good case for why bystander CPR is important and why having a good Samaritan law of some sort is important in, in arming people to do that. I definitely agree. Uh, let's see, Diedrich, you said you had more stories, right? So that's what I was trying to think of some good ones. Um, well, I can tell, um, I got a good one about, uh, <laughs> you know, Diedrich named his son after me, right? Did you know that? <laughs> his, no, I didn't. His son's first name is, is Bobby. And uh, so he named him after me, right? Something wow. like that. <laughs> Did he feel like he owed you after losing that competition for you with the inhaler? <laughs> for sure. For sure. That was it. Oh, man. So it's actually a much more interesting conversation because uh, Dietrich's first name is also Bobby, actually. Mm -hmm. so my first name is legally Robert, but, um, you know, Dietrich is Bobby. And we, um, we were hanging out one time, Dietrich and his wife and myself and my wife. Shortly after they found out that they were pregnant with their oldest and my wife was very excited and making conversation and said something like, oh, Candace, you know, what are you going to name him? And she goes, oh, we're going to name him Bobby after his father. My wife had never heard that Dietrich's first name was Bobby. <laughs> so there was this long, awkward pause as she kind of looked around the room and <laughs> wow. I realized I realized what was going on very quickly and said, did you did you know that his name is Bobby? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> what about us traveling up the elevators with a Jeep top? Yes. So in 2000, uh, late 2007, I bought a Jeep Wrangler, a, a new four-door Jeep Wrangler. And in April of uh, 08, we went to the South Carolina EMS Symposium in Myrtle Beach. And I've, of course, I bought the Jeep in the winter, so I kept the roof on all winter. And we finally had good weather. We're at the beach, and 
we said, we've got to take this roof off, but we're staying at this hotel. There's no storage. What are we going to do? Uh, we were on the like 19th floor or something. So we ended up taking the hard top off of my Jeep and finagling it into the world's smallest elevator. <laughs> and uh, we thought we could put it on a luggage card and wheel it in, but it was too big for the luggage card. And we had to position it just right. And this particular hotel only had like two or three elevators going up. So it, we were stopped four or five times for people to get on. And so we would, the doors would open and people would start to get on and then they would see the roof of a Jeep in the elevator, have this very perplexed look on their face and then, uh, you know, back out slowly. So we eventually made it up to the 19th floor and we finessed it down the hallway and into the room and propped it up against the wall and drove around Myrtle Beach for a few days with the roof off. That's, that's pretty, it was pretty good. <laughs> yeah, that actually sounds pretty fun. That's funny. <laughs> getting the, the whole roof thing up there, that, that sounds pretty awful. Um, what about those, uh, what are the new CPR dummies that have the lights and the arrows and, and, and stuff with that? Have you seen those? Yeah, there's a number of different ones and, um, you know, I'll, I'll stop short of recommending any brands or anything like that. Uh, but there's definitely evidence that's come out. In fact, there's a new study that was just published out of Israel or is about to be published out of Israel that says that, um, that there is a significant training benefit to having those real-time feedback uh, features on the mannequin. So if you're doing CPR correctly, you're doing the correct depth and correct rate, you'll get green lights or the arrows or whatever, depending on the mannequin that you're using. And if you're not doing CPR, if your compressions are too shallow or they're too fast or too slow, you'll get orange or red or something along those lines. So what that does is it allows us to practice correctly. Uh, you know, the old saying, practice makes perfect. The, the educator's version of that is practice makes permanent. Um, you have to practice correctly or practice perfectly to make perfect. So what we want to see is we, we encourage people to use the mannequins that have those feedback devices in them so that when they're practicing uh, in a classroom, they're not practicing incorrectly until the instructor comes around and corrects them, that they're actually getting feedback on what they're doing in real time so that they're practicing things the correct way. It's like riding a bike or anything else. You develop a muscle memory and you want to be able to use that in an emergency situation. So you want to practice and be very uh, familiar with how to do it correctly. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. They look pretty cool. Um, yeah, we've got, that's the ones we use at medical gear outfitters. We have to get feedback. They, they, mm -hmm. um, they can tell you, you know, your, your pace is too fast, too slow. Um, you know that your debt's right. So when you get all green lights, you know you're you're good to go, and you can keep the green lights going. Uh, right. If something turns red, you're like, oh, I need to fix that. Um, so it kind of helps us as instructors give a little bit quicker access to give to give the student feedback. Yes. There's even some now, some very fancy ones that you can connect to an iPad and project on a screen. Um, where they'll have different games that you can do. Where they'll have like each each mannequin has an ambulance and the better your skills are, the faster the ambulance drives. And so you, everyone starts ambulance at the same driver. times. And, uh, you know, if they're doing the people that do the best compressions, their ambulance gets to the destination faster or things like that. There's, so there's a bunch of different games that you can do to uh, create a, an atmosphere of competition for people to want to do better at CPR. So you're having a little bit of fun while you're also improving your life-saving skills. Yeah, that's actually very cool. What classes would you recommend that uh, our civilian medically minded people go get? Like if you, if you had to pick, you know, I don't know, it, it could be as many as you want or as few as you want, which ones and in which order would you recommend? Sure. So we have, we have two different classes that we ha uh, offer for non-healthcare providers for our civilian people. The first is a heart saver course. And that is a course that you, you take, you can learn CPR and or first aid. And at the end of the course, you get a completion card. So it takes about uh, four hours to do the CPR portion and about three hours to do first aid. So you can do one or the other or both all at once. And the idea behind that is you, you cover adult CPR, child CPR, infant CPR, and choking. And then the first aid module has a number of different things around bleeding control and how to manage people until EMS gets there. Uh, so that is, I think, kind of the best, more in-depth course that you could do for someone who's um, a civilian wanting to learn how to improve their CPR skills. There's also a course that we have called Family and Friends, which is for someone who doesn't need a card. They just kind of want to get a, a basic understanding of CPR and a skill set. That 
tends to be a little less expensive. It's a shorter course, um, but it still gives you time to practice on a, on a mannequin with someone who can give you some, some feedback and help you with that. Uh, in the US here, we have about 3,000 training centers around the country that offer those courses. So you can go to the American Heart Association's website at heart.org and uh, click on CPR. And there's a, a nice GPS function where you can find classes closer to you. Um, so for civilians, it would primarily be the heart saver CPR courses, which you'd be looking for. Yeah, there's uh, 132 classes in my area. Very That's good. awesome. Yeah, so they're out there and they're actually uh, incredibly inexpensive. And uh, I definitely recommend people go out there and take a look at those because we talk about everything, you know, we're always talking about like traumatic incidents and things like that. But again, I mean, you said that as Skinny Medic said that uh, all of his saves um, came from people performing CPR before he got there. You talked about the statistics, what, 45%, 40 to 45%. Yes. Makes uh, a significant difference. Yes. That's huge, man. I may have even said something that contradicted that on the show and I'm correcting myself right now. At, at some point I, I recall reading something and I think I regurgitated it without, uh, without actually checking it myself, which I hate doing, but that's, that's huge. That's big. It is. Yeah. And, and some places where what less than 1% saves. I never want to go there. So if you could just tell me where afterwards, <laughs> that's a lot of places to be honest with you. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. It's um, rough. Um, <clears throat> the CPR but, uh, training is important. And then, you know, the prices of AEDs are coming down. So uh, if your business, your church, your organization uh, can kind of pull some money together, get an AED that absolutely could, could save someone's life. Yeah, definitely. I thought, I thought about buying an AED and then I realized it's a, an awful idea. You should probably I, eat better. Yeah, I well no, I mean I don't I don't want one. I just know that we would literally use it just to shock each other. Yes. <laughs> it's probably just bad. We probably wouldn't recommend that. No, it's probably deadly. But back to what Dietrich said, I think it is uh you know, it is interesting to see how many cheaper AEDs are coming out on the market now. And I know there's at least a couple more that are awaiting FDA approval that'll be even less expensive. So it's it's uh more common now you'll see Police officers are trained in CPR. A lot of times they have AEDs in their cars now. Um, obviously, most firefighters are. And anytime that you're in a, a setting where a lot of people are congregating frequently, whether it's a church or a school or college or something like that, there should be AEDs available. They should be accessible, so not in a locked office that's not open on the weekends or something like that. And uh, people should have the training to respond and, and know what to do. I'm waiting until they come out one for the iPhone. That'd be put great. On, put, turn my app on, like bloop. It would give. Maybe we should come up with that, Sean. Maybe we should invent that. Like we can have where it gives you your beat, uh, your metronome, and it shocks them. Like it counts on every two minutes, and the iPhone's like, "Oh, we got to deliver a shock." Bloop. So you just like start and then just sit back and eat a cheeseburger. Well, you probably still have to do some chest compressions or like boss people around, make them do chest compressions. But right. if it would tell you like your rate, like ding, 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 and then it's probably a little fast, honestly. But um. Like my iPhone's cars. about three years old now, so the battery would die as soon as I started charging for the first <laughs> yes. shot. <laughs> you get one shock in and you're, yes. you're done. Make uh, it count. That's funny. That's crazy. And honestly, there's lots of AEDs on Amazon and Prime. There are. Yes. Yep. Interesting. And that honestly, yeah, there's there's some that even come with like the wall case and everything. Ooh, fancy. Yeah. Yeah. The last time I looked at them, they were about double the cost that I'm seeing on Amazon right now. Yeah, and like so, if you're depending on how good your relationship is with your local department, so you can get their name brand and would plug right in. So a lot of times like we, when we're working with fire departments, by that we'll ask what name brand the EMS is using, so that way the pads all just plug in and it's it's a quick transition over once the EMS gets there. Very cool. Yes. Yeah, and and don't think I didn't hear that. I should just eat better. Comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, putting an AED on while you eat a cheeseburger is probably not a good uh, long-term health plan. Yeah, no, it, it probably the worst. Catch up and French fries. You'll be good to go. It'll be fine. Yeah. Hey, kids, if I pass out, just push that orange button. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, like Chris Farley. I <laughs> uh, love it. What else do you want to cover, Dietrich? Um, you know, just to, you know, kind of cl in closing, just kind of thinking about, you know, we know what the healthcare system here is in America. Um, and I think overall it, it's, it's, it's good. We have issues like everyone else. Uh, but like internationally, what do you see some of the, Difference is different, and and obviously, you know, I, I you know EMS or first responders 
in other countries? There's a huge variance from, um, you know, some countries will have doctors running on the ambulances and some countries the, that I go to, they'll be minimal first aid training for the people who uh, work on the ambulance. So there's a really a, a broad variety of EMS providers around the world. Um, so for people who travel, like myself, I would say to you know, be very careful about looking at the country you're going to, know what the resources are there and know what your emergency plan is. Uh, I use the, the Joint Commission International's website pretty frequently because they do inspections of hospitals and things like that. So if I'm going to a country where I have less confidence in their healthcare system or particularly their emergency rooms, I'll uh, look for hospitals that are accredited by JCI on their website. And uh, you know, knowing what your emergency response number is. <clears throat> when, I, when I talk about EMS and activating EMS and calling for an ambulance, I don't say 911 out of habit because that's actually not the number you would use in a lot of countries. Uh, it could be 811, 111, 999. Um, and you really just need to know what that is everywhere that you go so that you know how to activate and get an ambulance or um, some sort of medical attention if you need it in an emergency. That's a great point. It really is. You can you can be doing great CPR, or you can be applying good pressure on a bleed, but if you don't know how to get an ambulance there, you know it's, it's not going to be a great outcome long term. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense. I actually I'd be like, do I dial the country code first? I don't understand. <laughs> Typically, if you're in country, you're good. Just dialing whatever the number is, uh, but it's important to know that ahead of time because you know once you're in that situation, you don't want to be connecting to some really dodgy uh, 3G signal, trying to Google what is the emergency number here and wherever you are. Yeah. What's the 911 number for right. whatever country I'm in? How do I call 911 in Azerbaijan? I don't know. Yes. I played hockey with a dude who they were on vacation and his wife like smashed her face into a, a water, water ski. Uh, no, uh, what do you call them? Watercraft. A jet oh. ski. Jet ski. <laughs> yeah. Uh, into like the the thing and like really messed her up and she had to like go to the emergency room and uh he said it was absolutely a nightmare and that that makes a ton of sense like understand how to get medical care if you need it when you go definitely and finding out uh you know who which hospitals have people that speak english in them things like that so far i've i've had a couple incidences where i've had to be hospitalized or at least go to the emergency room abroad and uh it's always been in countries where english is widely spoken uh, most recently, I got to go to the ER in Singapore in June, so that was exciting. Um, but uh, just for, I had some sinus issues that were compounding into ear and chest issues, so I had a little pneumonia, and then my ears weren't readjusting after the flight, so they were. Oh, uh, I had a partial rupture of one eardrum, so it was that super exciting. Um, but uh, fortunately, the healthcare system in Singapore is is pretty easy to get into, and uh, you know, very technologically advanced and similar to what we would have here. So that's good. Everything went well. That's awesome. That's a great point, Savan. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Awesome. Um, where can people find out more information? Like what are all the websites and where's the important places to go? Well, I would say for, uh, for CPR training, anything related to CPR, you can use heart.org, the American Heart Association's website. We publish our guidelines on there. We, um, We'll put any updates to materials. You can find courses on there. There's a lot of things. Very simple, heart.org. And then just look for the button that says CPR. I've been looking at it pretty much the entire time we've been on, just kind of looking through and finding stuff. I actually, I need to refresh my CPR skills. So I uh, message. I know my a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, can I you was just in, I was just in Colorado in September. I could have uh, come Dang it. Dang it. I was going to say, I could send you a card. No, I can't do that. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> I've got my card. I just need to, uh, I need a refresher. It's been a couple of years. I like to do it. Uh, I messaged my girlfriend. I was like, Hey, do you want to take a uh, CPR AED first, first aid class with me? And she's like, what? And I was like, yeah, no, it, it'll be fun. Trust me. I've done it before. She's like, I guess if you want me to. <laughs> so you're like, I, I need never, a lot of cheeseburgers. I need you know how to do chest compressions. You need to know how to do this. That's actually it. I'm gonna be like, babe, listen. Yes. I'm I'm fat and stupid. <laughs> and you need to know how to do CPR. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh you guys just figure you you guys just figured it out for me. That's exactly it. Yeah. <laughs> I have I've taught my wife CPR, my mom, my sisters. Yeah. It's uh it's worth the people around you knowing how to do CPR. Yeah, hundred percent agree. 
heart.org. Uh, do you have any other social media that like you do medical stuff on or personal stuff? Um, well, I'm on Instagram. It's uh, at rstantontx. And uh, I'm on LinkedIn. And yeah, that's about it. I, I guess I'm on Twitter, but I, I go on and uh, I read stuff on Twitter. That's how I keep up with the news, but I don't post a whole lot, but it's Bobby underscore Wales. All right. Awesome. Happy to have any uh, anyone follow my ramblings and <laughs> and uh, adventures around the world. So, very cool. It's been uh, it's been absolutely awesome having you on the show, man. Yeah, good to talk to you guys as well. Thank you, Bobby. I appreciate it. Hey, yeah. no problem. And if I'm, you guys uh, want to loop back next year? We have guidelines coming out in October of 2020, so we can uh, cover those. I actually think we should. I think we should always cover the guidelines uh, as they come out. I think it'll be a huge service to our listeners for sure. And Bobby, I, I'm really sorry that uh, Dietrich lost that competition for you. I'm sure that I am as well. You know, it's one of uh, it's one of my few failures in life, but it was a good learning experience. <laughs> what could have been? Uh, that's awesome. And no, like, but I've, I've been really happy for him. He had really good success and kind of dominated the the competition for a while after that. So yeah, I wasn't gonna, well. I wasn't going to mention that he won three times without you. I was just <laughs> I was going to let it be like that. No, that's fine. I'm, I'm thank you, thank I'm, you. I, fine with that i've uh you know gotten over the, the disappointment <laughs> <laughs> uh we all shop at medicalgearoutfitters.com coupon code civilian medical saves you 10 percent. dietrich any words of wisdom uh on how to win three times in a row um be nice <laughs> well um, yeah just who are you not the nice to the time we nice competed to together <laughs> no just be nice to the judges it's fine uh okay back rubs got it yes uh, that makes a lot of sense we'll talk to all of you next week Find us and subscribe at civmedical.com.